The Whisperer in Darkness by H. P. Lovecraft Chapter 8 Do not ask me how long my unexpected lapse into slumber lasted, or how much of what ensued was sheer dream. If I tell you that I awaked at a certain time, and heard and saw certain things, you will merely answer that I did not wake then, and that everything was a dream until the moment when I rushed out of the house, stumbled to the shed where I had seen the old Ford, and seized that ancient vehicle for a mad aimless race over the haunted hills which at last landed me, after hours of jolting and winding through forest-threatened labyrinths, in a village which turned out to be Townshend. You will also, of course, discount everything else in my report, and declare that all the pictures, record sounds, cylinder and machine sounds, and kindred evidences were bits of pure deception practised on me by the missing Henry Akeley. You will even hint that he conspired with other eccentrics to carry out a silly and elaborate hoax, that he had the express shipment removed at Keene, and that he had Noise make that terrifying wax record. It is odd, though, that Noise has not even yet been identified, that he was unknown at any of the villages near Akeley's place, though he must have been frequently in the region. I wish I had stopped to memorise the licence number of his car, or perhaps it is better after all that I did not. For I, despite all you can say, and despite all I sometimes try to say to myself, know that loathsome outside influences must be lurking there in the half-unknown hills, and that those influences have spies and emissaries in the world of men. To keep as far as possible from such influences and such emissaries is all that I ask of life in future. When my frantic story sent a sheriff's posse out to the farmhouse, Akeley was gone without leaving a trace. His loose dressing gown, yellow scarf, and foot bandages lay on the study floor near his corner easy chair, and it could not be decided whether any of his other apparel had vanished with him. The dogs and livestock were indeed missing, and there were some curious bullet holes both on the house's exterior and on some of the walls within, but beyond this nothing unusual could be detected. No cylinders or machines, none of the evidences I had brought in my valise, no queer odour or vibration sense, no footprints in the road, and none of the problematical things I glimpsed at the very last. I stayed a week in Brattleboro after my escape, making inquiries among people of every kind who had known Akeley, and the results convinced me that the matter is no figment of dream or delusion. Akeley's queer purchases of dogs and ammunition and chemicals, and the cutting of his telephone wires, are matters of record, while all who knew him, including his son in California, concede that his occasional remarks on strange studies had a certain consistency. Solid citizens believe he was mad, and unhesitatingly pronounce all reported evidences mere hoaxes devised with insane cunning, and perhaps abetted by eccentric associates. But the lowlier country folk sustain his statements in every detail. He had showed some of these rustics his photographs and black stone, and had played the hideous record for them, and they all said the footprints and buzzing voice were like those described in ancestral legends. They said, too, that suspicious sights and sounds had been noticed increasingly around Akeley's house after he found the black stone, and that the place was now avoided by everybody except the male man and other casual, tough-minded people. Dark Mountain and Round Hill were both notoriously haunted spots, and I could find no one who had ever closely explored either. Occasional disappearances of natives throughout the district's history were well attested, and these now included the semi-vagabond Walter Brown, whom Akeley's letters had mentioned. I even came upon one farmer who thought he had personally glimpsed one of the queer bodies at flood time in the swollen West River, but his tale was too confused to be really valuable. When I left Brattleboro, I resolved never to go back to Vermont, and I feel quite certain I shall keep my resolution. Those wild hills are surely the outpost of a frightful cosmic race, as I doubt all the less since reading that a new ninth planet has been glimpsed beyond Neptune, just as those influences had said it would be glimpsed. Astronomers, with a hideous appropriateness they little suspect, have named this thing Pluto. I feel beyond question that it is nothing less than knighted Yugoth, and I shiver when I try to figure out the real reason why its monstrous denizens wish it to be known in this way at this especial time. I vainly try to assure myself that these demoniac creatures are not gradually leading up to some new policy hurtful to the earth and its normal inhabitants. But I have still to tell of the ending of that terrible night in the farmhouse. As I have said, I did finally drop into a troubled doze, a doze filled with bits of dream which involved monstrous landscape glimpses. Just what awaked me I cannot yet say, 
but that I did indeed awake at this given point, I feel very certain. My first confused impression was of stealthily creaking floorboards in the hall outside my door, and of a clumsy, muffled fumbling at the latch. This, however, ceased almost at once, so that my really clear impressions began with the voices heard from the study below. There seemed to be several speakers, and I judged that they were controversially engaged. By the time I had listened a few seconds I was broad awake, for the nature of the voices was such as to make all thought of sleep ridiculous. The tones were curiously varied, and no one who had listened to that accursed phonograph record could harbour any doubts about the nature of at least two of them. Hideous though the idea was, I knew that I was under the same roof with nameless things from abysmal space, for those two voices were unmistakably the blasphemous buzzings which the outside beings used in their communication with men. The two were individually different, different in pitch, accent and tempo, but they were both of the same damnable general kind. A third voice was indubitably that of a mechanical utterance machine connected with one of the detached brains in the cylinders. There was as little doubt about that as about the buzzings, for the loud, metallic, lifeless voice of the previous evening, with its inflectionless, expressionless scraping and rattling, and its impersonal precision and deliberation, had been utterly unforgettable. For a time I did not pause to question whether the intelligence behind the scraping was the identical one which had formerly talked to me, but shortly afterward I reflected that any brain would emit vocal sounds of the same quality if linked to the same mechanical speech producer, the only possible differences being in language, rhythm, speed and pronunciation. To complete the eldritch colloquy, there were two actually human voices, one the crude speech of an unknown and evidently rustic man and the other the suave Bostonian tones of my erstwhile guide noise. As I tried to catch the words which the stoutly fashioned floor so bafflingly intercepted, I was also conscious of a great deal of stirring and scratching and shuffling in the room below, so that I could not escape the impression that it was full of living beings, many more than the few whose speech I could single out. The exact nature of this stirring is extremely hard to describe, for very few good bases of comparison exist. Objects seemed now and then to move across the room like conscious entities, the sound of their footfalls having something about it like a loose, hard-surfaced clattering, as of the contact of ill-coordinated surfaces of horn or hard rubber. It was, to use a more concrete but less accurate comparison, as if people with loose, splintery wooden shoes were shambling and rattling about on the polished board floor. On the nature and appearance of those responsible for the sounds, I did not care to speculate. Before long, I saw that it would be impossible to distinguish any connected discourse. Isolated words, including the names of Akeley and myself, now and then floated up, especially when uttered by the mechanical speech producer, but their true significance was lost for want of continuous context. Today I refused to form any definite deductions from them, and even their frightful effect on me was one of suggestion rather than of revelation. A terrible and abnormal conclave, I felt certain was assembled below me, but for what shocking deliberations I could not tell. It was curious how this unquestioned sense of the malign and the blasphemous pervaded me despite Akeley's assurances of the outsider's friendliness. With patient listening, I began to distinguish clearly between voices, even though I could not grasp much of what any of the voices said. I seemed to catch certain typical emotions behind some of the speakers. One of the buzzing voices, for example, held an unmistakable note of authority whilst the mechanical voice, notwithstanding its artificial loudness and regularity, seemed to be in a position of subordination and pleading. Noise's tones exuded a kind of conciliatory atmosphere. The others I could make no attempt to interpret. I did not hear the familiar whisper of Akeley, but well knew that such a sound could never penetrate the solid flooring of my room. I will try to set down some of the few disjointed words and other sounds I caught, labelling the speakers of the words as best I know how. It was from the speech machine that I first picked up a few recognisable phrases. The speech machine. Brought it on myself. Sent back the letters and the record. End on it. Taken in. Seeing and hearing. Damn you. Impersonal force after all. Fresh, shiny cylinder. Great God. First buzzing voice. Time we stopped. Small and human. Akeley, brain, saying. Second buzzing voice. Nyala Thotop, Wilmarth, records and letters, cheap imposture. 
noise. An unpronounceable word or name, possibly Engar Kathan. Harmless. Peace. Couple of weeks. Theatrical. Told you that before. First buzzing voice. No reason. Original plan. Effects. Noise can watch. Round hill. Fresh cylinder. Noises car. Noise. Well, all yours. Down here. Rest. Place. Several voices at once in indistinguishable speech. Many footsteps, including the peculiar loose stirring or clattering. A curious sort of flapping sound. The sound of an automobile starting and receding. Silence. That is the substance of what my ears brought me as I lay rigid upon that strange upstairs bed in the haunted farmhouse among the demoniac hills, lay there fully dressed, with a revolver clenched in my right hand and a pocket flashlight gripped in my left. I became, as I have said, broad awake, but a kind of obscure paralysis nevertheless kept me inert till long after the last echoes of the sounds had died away. I heard the wooden, deliberate ticking of the ancient Connecticut clock somewhere far below, and at last made out the irregular snoring of a sleeper. Akeley must have dozed off after the strange session, and I could well believe that he needed to do so. Just what to think or what to do was more than I could decide. After all, what had I heard beyond things which previous information might have led me to expect? Had I not known that the nameless outsiders were now freely admitted to the farmhouse? No doubt Akeley had been surprised by an unexpected visit from them. Yet something in that fragmentary discourse had chilled me immeasurably, raised the most grotesque and horrible doubts, and made me wish fervently that I might wake up and prove everything a dream. I think my subconscious mind must have caught something which my consciousness has not yet recognised. But what of Akeley? Was he not my friend, and would he not have protested if any harm were meant me? The peaceful snoring below seemed to cast ridicule on all my suddenly intensified fears. Was it possible that Akeley had been imposed upon and used as a lure to draw me into the hills with the letters and pictures and phonograph record? Did those beings mean to engulf us both in a common destruction because we had come to know too much? Again I thought of the abruptness and unnaturalness of that change in the situation which must have occurred between Akeley's penultimate and final letters. Something my instinct told me was terribly wrong. All was not as it seemed. That acrid coffee which I refused had there not been an attempt by some hidden, unknown entity to drug it. I must talk to Akeley at once and restore his sense of proportion. They had hypnotised him with their promises of cosmic revelations, but now he must listen to reason. We must get out of this before it would be too late. If he lacked the willpower to make the break for liberty, I would supply it. Or if I could not persuade him to go, I could at least go myself. Surely he would let me take his Ford and leave it in a garage at Brattleboro. I had noticed it in the shed, the door being left unlocked and open now that peril was deemed past and I believed there was a good chance of its being ready for instant use. That momentary dislike of Akeley which I had felt during, and after the evening's conversation was all gone now. He was in a position much like my own, and we must stick together. Knowing his indisposed condition, I hated to wake him at this juncture, but I knew that I must. I could not stay in this place till morning as matters stood. At last I felt able to act and stretched myself vigorously to regain command of my muscles. Arising with a caution more impulsive than deliberate, I found and donned my hat, took my valise, and started downstairs with the flashlight's aid. In my nervousness I kept the revolver clutched in my right hand, being able to take care of both valise and flashlight with my left. Why I exerted these precautions I do not really know, since I was even then on my way to awaken the only other occupant of the house. As I half tiptoed down the creaking stairs to the lower hall, I could hear the sleeper more plainly, and noticed that he must be in the room on my left, the living room I had not entered. On my right was the gaping blackness of the study in which I had heard the voices. Pushing open the unlatched door of the living room, I traced a path with the flashlight toward the source of the snoring, and finally turned the beams on the sleeper's face. But in the next second, I hastily turned them away and commenced a cat like retreat to the hall my caution this time springing from reason as well as from instinct. For the sleeper on the couch was not Akeley at all, but my quantum guide noise. Just what the real situation was, I could not guess. 
But common sense told me that the safest thing was to find out as much as possible before arousing anybody. Regaining the hall, I silently closed and latched the living room door after me, thereby lessening the chances of a waking noise. I now cautiously entered the dark study, where I expected to find Akeley, whether asleep or awake, in the great corner chair which was evidently his favourite resting place. As I advanced, the beams of my flashlight caught the great centre table, revealing one of the hellish cylinders with sight and hearing machines attached, and with a speech machine standing close by, ready to be connected at any moment. This, I reflected, must be the encased brain I had heard talking during the frightful conference, and for a second I had a perverse impulse to attach the speech machine and see what it would say. It must, I thought, be conscious of my presence even now since the sight and hearing attachments could not fail to disclose the rays of my flashlight and the faint creaking of the floor beneath my feet. But in the end I did not dare meddle with the thing. I idly saw that it was the fresh, shiny cylinder with Akeley's name on it, which I had noticed on the shelf earlier in the evening, and which my host had told me not to bother. Looking back at that moment, I can only regret my timidity and wish that I had boldly caused the apparatus to speak. God knows what mysteries and horrible doubts and questions of identity it might have cleared up. But then, it may be merciful that I let it alone. From the table I turned my flashlight to the corner where I thought Akeley was, but found to my perplexity that the great easy chair was empty of any human occupant asleep or awake. From the seat to the floor there trailed voluminously the familiar old dressing gown, and near it on the floor lay the yellow scarf and the huge foot bandages I had thought so odd. As I hesitated, striving to conjecture where Akeley might be, and why he had so suddenly discarded his necessary sick-room garments, I observed that the queer odour and sense of vibration were no longer in the room. What had been their cause? Curiously, it occurred to me that I had noticed them only in Akeley's vicinity. They had been strongest where he sat, and wholly absent except in the room with him, or just outside the doors of that room. I paused, letting the flashlight wander about the dark study and racking my brain for explanations of the turn affairs had taken. Would to heaven I had quietly left the place before allowing that light to rest again on the vacant chair. As it turned out, I did not leave quietly, but with a muffled shriek which must have disturbed, though it did not quite awake, the sleeping sentinel across the hall. That shriek and noises still unbroken snore are the last sounds I ever heard in that morbidity-choked farmhouse beneath the black wooded crest of a haunted mountain that focus of trans-cosmic horror amidst the lonely green hills and curse-muttering brooks of a spectral rustic land. It is a wonder that I did not drop flashlight, valise and revolver in my wild scramble, but somehow I failed to lose any of these. I actually managed to get out of that room, and that house without making any further noise, to drag myself and my belongings safely into the old ford in the shed and to set that archaic vehicle in motion towards some unknown point of safety in the black, moonless night. The ride that followed was a piece of delirium out of Poe or Rimbaud or the drawings of Doré. But finally I reached Townshend. That is all. If my sanity is still unshaken, I am lucky. Sometimes I fear what the years will bring, especially since that new planet Pluto has been so curiously discovered. As I have implied, I let my flashlight return to the vacant easy chair after its circuit of the room, then noticing for the first time the presence of certain objects in the seat made inconspicuous by the adjacent loose folds of the empty dressing gown. These are the objects, three in number, which the investigators did not find when they came later on. As I said at the outset, there was nothing of actual visual horror about them. The trouble was in what they led one to infer. Even now I have my moments of half-doubt, moments in which I half accept the scepticism of those who attribute my whole experience to dream and nerves and delusion. The three things were damnably clever constructions of their kind, and were furnished with ingenious metallic clamps to attach them to organic developments of which I dare not form any conjecture. I hope, devoutly hope, that they were the waxen products of a master artist, despite what my inmost fears tell me. Great God! That whisper in darkness with its morbid odour and vibrations. Sorcerer, emissary, changeling, outsider. That hideous repressed buzzing, and all the time in that fresh, shiny cylinder on the shelf. Poor devil. Prodigious surgical, biological, chemical and mechanical skill. For the things in the chair, perfect to the last, 
subtle detail of microscopic resemblance or identity were the face and hands of Henry Wentworth Akeley.